Have you ever visited a place like Florida or Washington, D.C., where the air is very humid? Maybe you're even from a place with a humid climate. You may have noticed, especially on a really hot day, that the air there feels really thick. People use words to describe the air like oppressive and stifling. Why is that? Well, it has to do with the interplay between the liquid and vapor forms of water in our environment. And that's the general topic of today's lesson. Not only for water, but for all volatile liquids. Oh, that word volatile. Remember, that word simply means that the liquid evaporates easily. So another example of a volatile liquid might be gasoline or rubbing alcohol. We'll focus our attention today on water. Not only because it's a typical example, but because these phenomena as related to water play such an important role in our everyday lives, affecting our weather, the climate, indeed the very air we breathe. Let's begin by considering this bottle of water sitting here on my desk. Looks perfectly tranquil, doesn't it? On the macroscopic level, it looks like there's nothing happening at all. But on the microscopic level, there's a flurry of activity both in the liquid water and in the air above it. Let's take a look. Now. Let's first clarify the model that we're looking at here. Below are the liquid water molecules. You can see the red oxygen atoms and the white hydrogen atoms which make up the water molecules. Above are molecules of dioxygen, those are the red double balls, and dinitrogen, the blue balls, which make up most of the air. Now clearly we've done some simplifying here. Let's see. First, we've left out the other components of the air, like carbon dioxide and argon and some other things. Second, we haven't shown all the movements the molecules are typically undergoing. You probably recall that there are three different kinds of motion in molecules. These are translational motion, that's movement from place to place, vibrational, and rotational. Notice that for our bottle of water, we're showing the translational motion and rotational motion, but not the vibrational motion. That's to keep both you and the programmer from going mad. Third, and this is where we begin to touch on our topic for today, we haven't yet shown how molecules can jump back and forth between the gas phase and the liquid phase. Let's talk about that in the next slide. Okay, now let's take a look at the way molecules exchange between these two phases, shall we? First, and most important, water molecules may jump up from the liquid phase into the air. In the process for those particular molecules, a phase change is occurring, isn't it? The water molecules are moving from the liquid phase into the gas phase. We say they are vaporizing. Likewise, water molecules found in the air, that is, in the gas phase, may condense into the liquid water. They, of course, are undergoing the phase change we call condensation. It turns out that these two processes are actually occurring simultaneously in the bottle of water sitting on my desk. And so the whole process looks like this. Now let me just briefly take you on a tangent so we can complete the model. Then we'll get back to what's happening with the water alone. It turns out that just as the water can vaporize and join the nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the gas phase, likewise, a few oxygen and nitrogen molecules can jump from the gas phase into the liquid water. Now, not very many do, it turns out. Certainly not anywhere near the number of water molecules that change phase. Nonetheless, this process is worth pointing out because it accounts for the oxygen that we find dissolved in our lakes, oceans, and rivers and which is essential to the fish found there. So it's true that in the water in my bottle there is some oxygen and nitrogen dissolved, as well as carbon dioxide and other things from the air. We'll come back to this later, but in the meantime we're going to focus all our attention for a while on what the water molecules are doing. And we'll ignore all the other exchanges of molecules between the two phases. Just keep those tucked away in the back of your mind. So, back to water. We see in our model water molecules jumping back and forth between the liquid and gas phases. Now I happen to be recording this module in the dry climate of Utah, so I'm quite certain that if I were to leave this bottle sitting on my desk open to the air for any length of time, 
the water in the bottle would gradually disappear, and in fact within a day or two it would all be gone. That's what I would observe on the macroscopic scale. Now, how can our microscopic scale model explain this? Well, if the rate at which water molecules are vaporizing is faster than the rate at which they're condensing, then that's exactly what we would observe on the macroscopic scale, isn't it? The net effect would be that more evaporation was occurring than condensation. But how is that possible? As time passed and more and more water molecules evaporated, wouldn't you expect the water molecules to bunch up in the air above the bottle until there were too many of them to fit, like this? Well, let's think about it. Not if the bottle were open to the room air. You see, the gas phase water molecules are constantly escaping out of the bottle into the room, out into the hall, out the door, and out into the dry Utah air. There are plenty of places around here for the molecules to escape to without ever bunching up. So indeed, the water in the bottle vaporizes faster than it condenses, and the net effect is that the liquid water gradually disappears. But now, let's think what would happen if I put a tight lid on my bottle. We'll see about that in our next slide. So let's put a lid on my water bottle, shall we? What do you suppose will happen to the water now? Well, intuition and some past experience tell me that if the lid is tight enough, the liquid water won't disappear. And that is indeed what we observe on the macroscopic scale. Again, though, let's ask ourselves how the microscopic model explains this result. Here's a model of our closed water bottle just after I put on the lid. There were already some water molecules in the gas phase. And again, we see the liquid water evaporating and the gaseous water condensing. At first, as in the previous case, the evaporation is occurring at a more rapid rate than condensation because there aren't all that many water molecules in the gas phase to begin with. But the gas phase water molecules can't escape out into the room, so they begin to accumulate. As they do, the rate of condensation increases. There are just more molecules present in the gas phase to condense. And the rate continues to increase until the rate of condensation is the same as the rate of evaporation. And at this point, we reach a kind of steady state. Water molecules are entering and leaving the gas phase at the same rate, so the number of water molecules in the gas phase stays the same. This condition has a name. We say that equilibrium has been achieved. On a macroscopic scale, it looks like a static situation. Nothing is changing. But on the microscopic scale, molecules are still moving back and forth. For this reason, we call this kind of equilibrium dynamic equilibrium. Now how do we characterize this special equilibrium state? Well one way would be to measure the pressure of the water vapor. Remember that the pressure of a gas is directly proportional to the number of molecules. And pressure is something we can measure relatively easily. So if we set up a closed container with liquid water in it and some space above the water, let it sit for a long time, then measure the pressure of the water vapor, we can say something like this. Water liquid is in equilibrium with water vapor when the pressure of the water vapor is such and such. That's one unique way to determine when equilibrium has been reached, right? It's interesting to note, by the way, that at room temperature this pressure is about 23 torr. This value of the pressure of water vapor has a special name. We call it the equilibrium vapor pressure, or simply vapor pressure, of water at room temperature. Now take note that the term vapor pressure is often used with a special meaning. It's not just the pressure of the vapor under any conditions. It refers only to the pressure of the vapor when it is at equilibrium with the liquid. So keep in mind the difference between the term vapor pressure and the general term pressure of the vapor, because these terms can be confusing. And we'll generally call the vapor pressure under equilibrium conditions the equilibrium vapor pressure, just to be clear. 
So how do you propose we go about it? actually doing this experiment. Hmm. It's not quite as easy as maybe it sounds at first. For example, if I do it the way I have set it out in my bottle on the desk, how will I conveniently measure the pressure of the water vapor in the bottle? If I just measure the pressure of the gas in the bottle, that won't do the job, because there's not only water vapor in there, there's also air. Okay, well, then what if we were to start out with a vacuum above the liquid water? I could just use a vacuum pump and pull all the air out, leaving the system sit for a long time, then measuring the pressure of the gas in the bottle. And that would be the pressure of the water vapor, right? Yes, and in fact, it would be the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at that temperature. Okay, that's that. Now, here's a thought-provoking question for you. What if I somehow did have a way of measuring the pressure of the water vapor even when air was present? Would the equilibrium vapor pressure of water we measure this way be different than when we measured it in a vacuum? In other words, does the pressure of another gas, like air, affect the vapor pressure of a liquid? And here's the surprising answer. No, it doesn't. At least not enough to matter for our purposes here especially when the pressures of the other gases are relatively low, as in normal air. Henry put it well when he said, every gas is a vacuum to every other. And to a certain approximation, this is true. The bottom line is this. The vapor pressure of a liquid, and remember, that term has a special meaning, is largely independent of whatever other gases are present. Just for a moment, let's talk a little more terminology. We've already described how the term vapor pressure has a special meaning. Be careful that you use that term only when appropriate, that is, only when equilibrium conditions are in force. But there's another pressure term that students are expected to know, but often struggle to use appropriately and that's partial pressure. Remember that in any mixture of gases, each gas in the mixture exerts its own pressure. In other words, the molecules of that gas contribute part of the total pressure exerted by the mixture, hence partial pressure. Naturally, the partial pressures of all the gases in the mixture add up to the total pressure. Take, for example, our simple model of air as a mixture of 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen molecules. For this simple kind of air, 80% of the total air pressure comes from the motions of nitrogen molecules and 20% from the motions of oxygen molecules. Now what if I added some liquid water to a closed bottle of this simple air? Well, after all we've said so far, you know exactly what would happen, right? water would begin to evaporate and continue to do so until equilibrium and hence its vapor pressure was reached. But now let's first consider what would happen to the total gas pressure in the bottle. What do you think? It would go up. Why? Because the pressures of oxygen and nitrogen haven't gone away but the additional water vapor molecules now exert an additional pressure, we say a partial pressure, of their own. So in this particular case, once equilibrium is achieved, we can call the pressure exerted by the water vapor both the partial pressure of water and the vapor pressure of water. In this one circumstance, they are the same. But what about times during the process before equilibrium is achieved? What then? Well, we still have a pressure of water vapor. It's just not yet reached the vapor pressure. Remember, that's a specialized term. And of course, that pressure exerted by the water vapor molecules is at that moment the partial pressure of water vapor in the container. Now for a semantic conundrum. Huh? What if the container had started out with a vacuum when we added the liquid water? Could we call the pressure of water vapor at each point in time its partial pressure, then? <coughs> Strictly speaking, no. Why? Because the pressure of water vapor is not part of the total pressure, it is the total pressure. So it would be silly to call it the partial pressure. 
Now this may seem like hair splitting to you, but in fact it is the hallmark of the well-educated chemist to understand when it's appropriate to use these terms. Oh, and by the way, it could make a difference on your exams as well, I suppose. We could create a graph that would clearly depict what happens to the water vapor pressure in my bottle of water over time. Let's do that. We'll put time on the x-axis and the water vapor pressure on the y-axis. At time zero, we introduce liquid water into the bottle and cover it tightly. Liquid water evaporates so that the partial pressure of water vapor rises over time. Remember, I can call it partial pressure because there is also air in the bottle. As the pressure of water vapor approaches its maximum value, that is the so-called equilibrium vapor pressure of water, the curve flattens. And after enough time, it completely flattens out at the vapor pressure value. Now what would the curve look like if I plotted total pressure instead of the partial pressure of water? Well, it would look the same, except it would have the pressure of the air added to each value, like this. And that would be one way of measuring the equilibrium vapor pressure of water, wouldn't it? The equilibrium vapor pressure would be the difference between the starting value and the ending value, like this. Now, do you suppose the equilibrium vapor pressure value would be the same under all conditions? We already pointed out that the equilibrium vapor pressure is independent of the total gas pressure of other gases present, didn't we? at least under reasonable total pressures. But what about temperature? Well, let's draw on our everyday experience. I'm sure you're already aware that liquids become more volatile, that is, they evaporate faster, at higher temperatures, right? So, as you might suspect, the equilibrium vapor pressure of a liquid rises with the temperature. For example, while the equilibrium vapor pressure of water is 23 torr at room temperature, it's 760 torr at 100 degrees Celsius. This last pressure happens to be the atmospheric pressure at sea level. And when the vapor pressure reaches atmospheric pressure, the liquid boils. So, rightly enough, the boiling point of water at sea level is 100 degrees Celsius. Well, it's amazing what you can learn from a simple bottle of water, isn't it? So getting back to where we started, how do these principles relate to the feel of the air in humid versus dry climates? To answer, let's use our bottle of water as a model for the atmosphere where you live. Think of the air in the bottle like a big pocket of air around your hometown. And think of the sample of liquid water we added to the bottle like a lake. If the lake in your hometown is very large, with a large surface area, a lot of water vapor can evaporate quickly and the partial pressure of water vapor in your area can approach the so-called equilibrium vapor pressure value. Now, in describing the weather, we quantify this effect. That is, we can make a fraction of the partial pressure of water vapor in the air over the equilibrium vapor pressure. Now, if we multiply by 100, we can express this fraction as a percentage of the highest possible value, that is, of the equilibrium vapor pressure value at that temperature. We call that fraction the percent humidity. So if your hometown has many sources of water and a lot of water vapor accumulates in the air, the percent humidity will be very high. So how does that make the air feel? Well, first of all, the partial pressure of water vapor adds to the total pressure of the air. That makes the air denser. And in addition, Here's the most important part. It adds to the total heat capacity of the air. It turns out water has a high heat capacity compared to the nitrogen and oxygen which make up most of the air. So the air is denser at higher humidity and it can hold more heat. And these factors make the air feel stifling and oppressive when it's hot.